Because today we're going to see that Jonah is in a situation that he cannot handle. He cannot fix. And we're going to see exactly what he did. In Jonah chapter 1, verses 17 through chapter 2, verse 10, we see that God sends a great fish problem to Jonah, a problem that he can't handle. And we're going to see how Jonah respond. Today, we're going to look at the great fish problem, and then we're going to talk about three truths that we can see in this passage, three truths about the great fish problems that God sends into our lives and how we should respond to them. And today, if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, what this passage should help you understand is that God in his love for you will send a great fish problem into your life to bring you back into fellowship with him. And he does it because he loves you. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, you need to know that God in his love for you pursues you as well. He's inviting you to come to him through faith in Christ and experience his love forever. And that's what he's inviting you to do today. As we begin, let me give you like kind of the background and the context of what we started with last week so we can see kind of the flow of the story. We, we talked last week and we understand that Jonah is a prophet. He is God's mailman. God will give him a, a message and he will go deliver the message. That's what it means to be a prophet. But we find out that God gives Jonah a message to go deliver to the city of Nineveh. The, the wicked, corrupt capital of the Assyrian Empire. And Jonah receives the message, but we understand that Jonah says no. In fact, he goes to the port city of Joppa, he gets a ticket, he says, I want to go the furthest away I can from Nineveh, it looks like it, and he's going in the opposite direction. We have no idea at this point really why Jonah has said no. We find out later. But what is very clear at the very beginning is that God loves Jonah too much to allow him to walk out of his will, to walk out of his presence. And so God, in his love for Jonah, he, he sends, he hurls, he throws a great storm. This is a storm that God sends. This is a storm that's no ordinary storm. This storm has a purpose that God creates. And the purpose is to be a wake-up call for Jonah. God is saying, Jonah, Look at what you're doing. But Jonah doesn't respond. And so we see the sailors who are in the boat with Jonah who are getting more and more aware that there is one true God by the name of Yahweh and they're getting aware of his power and who he is. They start asking Jonah, what, what can we do to stay alive? And they say, Jonah says, well, well, throw me overboard, which means that Jonah is going to go to a certain death. And they're not happy with that option at first. They try to row back to shore to save Jonah, but they realize they can't do it. And so they take Jonah and they're getting ready to throw him overboard and they cry out to the one true God, Yahweh, and they say, don't hold us accountable for this guy. We're just trying to obey you. And as they throw him overboard, the great storm stops. The sea's calm. And the sailors who were once afraid of the great storm are now in awe of the great God who actually sent the great storm. They are now in awe of the great God who created land and sea and heaven and earth. They're in awe of the great God who controls everything. And God has revealed himself to these guys and they respond the only way they can. They worship and they make vows. And all the while, Jonah is spiraling to the bottom of the Mediterranean. But that's not the end of the story. God's not done. Honestly, we're really still more in the beginning of it. Because what we see in chapter 1, verse 17, is that the same God who sent the great storm now sends the great fish. Look at what it says in chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, 
And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I think it's important to see that the Lord had prepared the great fish. As the great storm was no ordinary storm. It was a storm that was created by God, sent by God, hurled by God for a simple purpose. This is not an ordinary fish. This is a fish that is created by God, sent by God for a purpose. God is the one who prepared the fish and sent it to capture, to eat, to swallow Jonah. Now, as we begin having these discussions, there's people who are critics of the Bible, and they always begin asking, well, is it really possible for a guy to spend three days and three nights in the belly of a fish? I mean, could that really happen? And we as believers, we want to argue the veracity, the validity, the the truthfulness of God's Word, and so we usually come at that argument with natural world arguments, We'll bring up James Bartley, who in 1891 uh, spent two days in in the belly of a whale before he was cut out by his friends who were were, were sailors. We'll bring up that famous article in Encyclopedia Britannica that that was republished over and over again, or or the, the Princeton Theological Review that gave really a lot of scientific evidence of why someone could actually not only survive Uh, in in a great fish, in a whale, but why it's even plausible and possible. And I want to tell you, there's nothing wrong with doing those arguments. There's nothing wrong with with coming at this from from a natural world argument and and arguing from the, the facts that we have of why this is plausible. Once again, there's nothing wrong with it. I just don't think it's necessary. I'll just be truthful. That's my perspective. And you go, Brad, why don't you think it's necessary? Because this is not an ordinary fish. God created this fish. God sent this fish. God prepared this fish for this purpose. See, we have a God who is not bound by the natural world. We have a God who doesn't have to follow the parameters of those around us. I believe this fish is a miracle. And by miracle, I mean this. Miracle is just when God sticks his hand in the natural world he created and shakes it up. That's what a miracle is. While God does usually work within the parameters of the natural world he created, he's not bound by it. And so often he'll stick his hand in the natural world and shake it up to prove who he is. That's what Jesus did over and over again with the the miracles of the New Testament. Over and over again, Jesus saying, I am God because I'm sticking my hand in the natural world and doing what you can't do. And so often God will do the same thing. God is not bound by nature. God is not bound by the same parameters. God has no limits. He can do whatever he wants to. And from my opinion, this great fish could have wall-to-wall shy carpet in it. He could have a disco ball hanging in the center of it and with the Bee Gees singing, staying alive 24-7 through it. (laughs) He's without limits. See, our problem in my mind is, is, is that so often... We get lost focusing on the great fish and we forget it ain't about the great fish. It's about the great God who sent the great fish. Theologian G. Campbell Morgan always encouraged us. He said this, men have been looking so hard at the great fish that they have failed to see the great God. I'll tell you, it's not about the fish. It's about the God. So put it in perspective, you got Jonah who's a man of God. He is a man who is a male man that God sends for his messages. God gives a message and he says no. He goes the opposite direction. And so God in his love makes a great storm, hurls a great storm, puts a great storm to get his attention as a wake-up call, but Jonah doesn't get it. Jonah still refuses. And so now a great God sends a great fish and puts Jonah in a situation, in a problem that he can't run from anymore, that he can't ignore anymore, that he can't manipulate anymore. God puts Jonah in a problem where Jonah has to face the fact that he's been running from God. He can't continue to turn his back on it. This morning, what you need to understand that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're a believer or an unbeliever. That a great and loving God will send a great fish problem into your life 
to get you to stop running from him. See, this morning, if you're not a Christian, you need to know that God will give you a problem, a problem that's too big for you to handle, a problem that will drive you to your needs, a problem that you can't ignore, a problem that you can't run from, a problem that you can't manipulate for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that's for you to come to him through faith in Christ. See, God loves you. And it's his design. He created you. He made you to be in a love relationship with him. For you to stop running away from him and turn back to him believing that Jesus alone can't forgive you of your sin. Jesus alone can rescue you from your separation from God. That Jesus alone can bring you into a relationship with God because Jesus alone died on the cross for you to pay for the penalty of your sin. Listen, if you're honest, you will admit that God has revealed himself to you and his love for you in a lot of ways. He's done it through creation, the fact that you know who he is and that he exists. He's done it through other people. They've come and talked to you and he has done circumstances in your life, situations even in your life, even great fish problems let you know who he is and what he offers. But the greatest way that God has shown his love for you is that Jesus died on the cross to pay for the penalty of your sin, a debt that you can't pay. And God in his love for you will send a situation, a great fish problem that you can't handle. So you have to admit who he is and take seriously his offer to come to him through faith in Christ. And he does it because he loves you. This morning, you need to accept the offer from a God who loves you. Come to him through faith in Christ and know that love. That's why you're here. Christian, let me ask you a question. Do you think that a loving God would send a great fish problem into your life? Do you think that when you have told him no, that you've walked away out of fellowship with him, when, when you've gone off to do what you think is right and, and gotten out of his will and his way and his word, do you think a loving God will send a great fish problem, a problem that's too big for you to handle, a problem that you can't ignore, a problem that you can't manipulate so that you will come back to fellowship with him? Do you think a loving God loves you that much? Yeah. Listen, that, that's what verses one through 17 is all about. That God loves us so much that he will pursue us even when we disobey him. That he's a faithful God even when we're unfaithful to him. And then when we choose to walk out of his fellowship, he runs after us out of that love. Now let me just make a few things clear again because I've had a few questions about it this week. And I said this last week and I want to say it again. Not, N-O-T, not every problem in your life is being thrown at you by God to get you to come back. Not every problem. Understand that some problems are because we are in a fallen world. This is not heaven. You will be sick. You will have broken relationships. It ain't heaven. There's gonna be problems. Number two, Christians, sometimes God works in your life for the glory of his name. It's your will sometimes to go through difficulty so he can shine through you. That's what he does. But sometimes we tell him no. And sometimes we walk out of his fellowship. And sometimes we say we're gonna do it in our will and our way and not yours. We're not gonna follow your word. We're gonna do what we wanna do. And in those times, a loving God will put you in a great fish problem, a problem too big for you to handle, so that you gotta face what's going on. And he does it because he loves us. Do not forget Proverbs chapter three, verses 11 through 12, Hebrews chapter 12, verses five through six. God disciplines those that he loves. He's not doing it to hurt you, he's doing it because he loves you. He knows the best place to be is in fellowship with him. So, when God sends a great fish problem into your life, the questions that we may need to ask are, what is he doing and how should we respond? What's the purpose of all this and what do I need to do? And I will tell you, those questions are answered in chapter two, verses one through nine. 
that in Jonah's psalm, in Joah's poetic prayer, we're gonna see three truths about the great fish problems that God puts in our life. Three truths about the great fish problems God puts in our life and what we need to do when we're there. First truth is seen in verses one through two. First truth is seen in verses one through two. And the first truth about the great fish problem is this, is that great fish problems are always more than we can handle. Great fish problems are harder. They're bigger than what you can do on your own by design. And they're made that way so that you have to cry out to God. They're harder than what you can do so that you will cry out to God. Look at what it says in verses one through two in chapter two. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly, and he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard me, and you heard my voice. Understand that it was from inside the belly of the great fish that Jonah started talking to God again. One thing that we should see through all chapter one is that as soon as Jonah got the message from God, he stopped talking to God. Even in the middle of the great storm, when everybody was talking to God, talking to any gods, Jonah's the only one who's not talking to God. Jonah refused to talk to God until he was in the belly of the great fish. And it's often because of great fish problems that we'll start crying out to God because we know we have no other options. So how bad was it to be in the belly of the great fish? Well, honestly, no one really knows. I've read a lot of uh, examples, things people have said. I like Charles Swindoll's take on it the best. Charles Swindoll said this, pitch black, sloshing gastric juices wash over you, burning skin, eyes, throat, nostrils. Oxygen is scarce, and each frantic gulp of air is saturated with salt water. The rancid smell of digested food causes you to throw up repeatedly until you have only dry heaves left. Everything you touch has the slimy feel of the mucous membrane that lines the stomach. You feel claustrophobic. With every turn and dive of the great fish, you slip and slide in the cesspool of digestive fluid. There are no footholds, no blankets to keep you warm with the cold, clammy depths of the sea. And all that time, Jonah knew he was there because of his own choices. And all that time, Jonah knew he was there because of his own choices. Christian, you ever been there? You ever been into a problem that was too big for you to handle? A problem that really you felt like you had no hope and there was no hope? A problem that you were desperately struggling in? And the worst part of it is that you're there because you did it to yourself. You chose to walk out of God's will. You chose to walk out of his way. You chose to walk out of his word. You knew you were there because of the choices you had made. You ever felt like that? Because that's what Jonah felt like. So what did Jonah do? What did Jonah do in the middle of all of this? What did did Jonah do when he is in a situation that's too big for him to handle, that, that, that he can't fix himself? What does he do? He cries out to God. Well, why does he cry out to God? He's got no other options. There's no other way to go. He can't fix it himself. And when he cried out to God, he found out something really important, really amazing, and it's the fact that God had never left him. Look again at what it says at verse two. 
He says, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. He didn't do it before then. It was when he was in the middle of the belly of the fish that he started crying out to God. And then he says something important next. He says, and he answered me. That while Jonah had forsaken God, God had never forsaken Jonah. And while Jonah was unfaithful to God, God is always faithful. What Jonah found out in the middle of his big fish problem is that while he couldn't fix it, God had never left him. And that's the point of the problem. Christian, maybe you've been running away from God. Maybe he's told you to do something and you know you haven't done it. You've walked out of his will, his way, and his word and you're doing what seems best for you. And maybe you are in a situation that you can't fix that you know is greater than you and you just feel like you cannot do anything with it and you know it's because you brought yourself there. What do you do? You cry out to God and allow him to remind you that he loves you and that he's never left you and that he's always faithful. See, that's the point of the big fish problem is for you to cry out to God because he loves you. The second truth we see about big fish problems is that they send you to rock bottom. The second truth we see about big fish problems is they send you to rock bottom so that you will crave God's presence. They send you to rock bottom so you will crave God's presence. Look at what it says in verses three through six. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. And then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul, the deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Did you have brought me up my life from the pit? Oh Lord, my God. Now understand that verses one through nine in Jonah are written in Hebrew poetry. This is Jonah's psalm, Jonah's poetic prayer. It is poetry, probably in your uh, versions, in your translations, it's set apart as different. It's written different than it is the other narrative. It is poetry. It uses metaphors and allusions like all poetry. It uses flowery language like all poetry. Now do understand, I've never been a big fan of poetry. You might like it, I don't. I'm not a big fan, I've never really understood it. Yet I get this, this is pretty clear. See Jonah is saying this is how I feel. I feel like I am just completely, Lord, I just feel like this is gonna kill me. I feel this is too much for me to handle. This is a problem too much for me to bear. And we're sitting there going, of course it's a big problem. You're stuck in a great fish. Of course it's gonna be too much for you to bear. But the neat thing about this is that Jonah really isn't talking about his location. He's talking more about what he feels. Verse four is very central. Verse four, Jonah says, then I said, I have been cast out of your sight. Jonah's saying, what's the worst part about all this is, I don't feel like, God, you're with me anymore. I feel like I've been expelled from your presence. I feel that I'm not walking with you anymore. I don't feel your presence in my life, God. I just feel like we're separated because of this. Jonah's greatest deal is not the fact that he's stuck in a great fish. He's saying, I feel separated from God. And then in the back of verse four, he says this, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Temple's where you met with God. The temple's where you worship God. Jonah is saying, I crave your presence. I crave to be in the temple. I crave to worship you. I crave to see you. Jonah is saying, my problem, what I'm hitting rock bottom about is, God, I can't feel you. God, I can't see you, and I long to be in your presence again. Now, this problem that I'm facing, that I've done to myself, 
I feel like you're not with me anymore. And all I want is to know that you're here. Christian, have you ever felt like that? Have you ever walked out of God's will and and you know you did it to yourself and, and you're facing problems that are too big for you and the big deal is you just don't feel like God is with you anymore. You don't feel like he's walking with you. You long to hear him again. You long to feel him again. You long to know that the Holy Spirit is walking with you. You crave his presence. And Christian, what you need to understand is that's the purpose of the big fish problem. See, we've chosen to walk out of fellowship with God. We chose to live in our will and our ways and not follow his word anymore. And so God says, let me let you feel like when you're not with me. Let me show you what it feels like when you're out of fellowship with me. And we crave his presence. See, Jonah says the worst part about this whole thing is, Lord, I can't feel you anymore. But I want to. And Christian, if you're facing a big fish problem and you're not feeling God, you're not hearing him and you're longing for it, no, that's the point. And why is God doing it? Because he loves you. And he wants you to know that the best place is to be with him. It's because he loves you. Turn back to our text, the third truth that we see from Jonah's prayer, from his poetic prayer, from his, from his psalm. The third truth that we see is that, is that great fish problems will change our perspective so that we'll change our priorities. Great fish problems will change our perspective so that we will change our priorities. Look at what it says in verses seven through nine. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy or they they forsake God's mercy that he would give to them but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Rescue, salvation, deliverance is of the Lord. Understand that Jonah was working on his own perspective. His perspective was centered on self. God gave him a message and said, Jonah, you're my mailman. Go take my message to Nineveh like you're supposed to do. And for some reason, we don't really know for sure yet. Jonah just goes, nope. When I look at it, when I see it from my perspective, God, I don't wanna do this. This doesn't make sense to me. I don't like it. I'm not gonna be a part of it. And so because Jonah's perspective was about self, about doing what he thought was right, then that made his priorities about himself. I am going to do what I wanna do. My actions are gonna fulfill what I want. And therefore he started running away from God. But God loves Jonah too much. God says, Jonah, we're not gonna do this anymore. And so God puts Jonah in a great fish problem in a place that he can't run, in a place he can't manipulate. And he has to look at himself and talk about his self-perspective, his self-priorities. And what's neat that we see that the longer he's in the great fish, we get the understanding that his perspective starts changing. Uh, He he says in verse seven, I remembered the Lord. I stopped thinking about me and I started thinking about him about his mercy, about his love, his grace, his provision. I kept thinking about what he has done for me. And because Jonah started to stop thinking about self and started thinking about God, Jonah's perspective changed and his priorities changed. He says, I'm gonna stop running after what I wanna do, God, and I'm gonna start running after what you wanna do, God. I'm gonna do what you want me to do because I know your love for me and I know how much you care for me and I know what you want me to do. And so God, I am going to fulfill my vows to you. I'm going to be that mailman. I'm gonna go take that letter. 
he was in the great fish. A problem that Jonah could not avoid, could not ignore, could not manipulate. Let Jonah stop thinking about self and his priorities. He started thinking about God and his love and God's priorities. And out of God's love for him and his love for God, he says, I'm gonna fill my vows. I'm gonna do what you asked me to do. Christian, here is always the great question. How do we repay a God who rescues us from our separation from him, who himself pays a debt that we can't pay? How do we repay a God like that? How do you repay a God who pursues you out of his love for you and runs after you even when you are disobedient to him? How do you repay a God who shows you so much love and does so much for you? And the answer is you can't. And you're not expected to. But here's what we can do because this is what he asked us to do. He just says, obey me. That's just it, obey me. We can't repay him, so God just says, obey me. That's, that's all I'm asking you to do. Obey me because you love me and obey me because you know that I love you and what's best for you. I mean, isn't that what Jesus said in John 14, 15, that those who love me will do as I commanded? That those who love me will obey me? And so, in our love for him, knowing his love for us, we fulfill our vows. We do what he's asked us to do. So Christian, let me ask you, are you fulfilling your vows to God today? You know, that vow that you made, Lord, if you save me, I will make you the Lord of my life. Lord, I will give every day to you. God, I will seek you and follow you. God, I want to be in your fellowship, in your presence. God, I wanna run after you, run after your priorities. Christian, are you fulfilling your vows to your king? I hope so. Because if not, a great fish may be coming your way. Because God loves his people too much to allow them to exist out of his fellowship. In his love for you, he is going to come to you and put you in a position to where you have to look at what you're doing and respond to him. And why does he do it? Because he loves us. And he knows that true joy, true peace, true happiness is found in his presence alone. It's because he loves you. So as we come to the end of this portion of, of our story of Jonah, the question we'd like to ask is, is how should we respond at this moment? How does it apply to us? And I think the, the best way is that we need to respond to the great fish problems that are in our life. We need to respond to them. What, what does that mean to each of us? Well, this morning, if, if you're not a Christian, it means that, that God is calling you to stop running from him and, and to turn to him through faith in Christ and have a relationship with him through faith in Christ. In just a few moments, we're gonna have an invitation and that's just a time that you're just invited to respond as the Holy Spirit is leading you. And listen, I, I do believe that the Holy Spirit is making you just perfectly aware of your separation from God and, and your need to come to him through faith of Christ in a way that you understand. In the invitation, we'll be standing, we'll be singing. I, I encourage you as Holy Spirit moves you to step out and come talk to us down here. We, we'd love to tell you more about Christ and give you a vision for what your life would look like if you had a relationship with God through him. Christian, let me ask you this. What do you think it would look like if, if we all actually respond to the great fish problems in our life? 
What would happen if we actually cried out to God and craved his presence and, and changed our priorities to, to meet his will? What, what, what do you think that would change? Well, I don't know specifically in your life, and, and I can talk to you later about my life, but what I would just say this is what we would see is that we have a loving, amazing, forgiving God. And if we're willing, he will restore that fellowship. And more than that, he'll put us right back on the place and the path to serving him. Because that's what we see in verse 10. As soon as Jonah says, God, I'm going to fulfill my vows to you, God speaks to the great fish and he throws them up on the shore for him to go do what he was supposed to do. That's an amazing, forgiving, merciful, loving God. So Christian, are you running away from him this morning? Are you in a great fish problem? What you need to know is that God is pursuing you. He is providing, he's a way, he is drawing you to come back to him, but you still have to respond. You have to be willing. So as we enter into the invitation, just a few moments, Christian, I I just urge you just to pray and say, God, if there's anywhere that I'm not on board, anywhere that I've said no to you, anywhere that I'm not where I'm supposed to be, Lord, forgive me. I want that fellowship. And I'll do whatever you want me to do because being with you is far better than not feeling you in my presence. Being in your will is always better than being out. As you're praying through that, if you need help and encouragement, we'll be down here. The altar will be open, or you can pray with those beside you. This morning, just may we all seek the Holy Spirit, be open to what he says, and may we respond at this moment as he tells us to.